everyone and welcome to Nature Live Online, where we bring the Natural History Museum of London to your homes. From the well-known and beloved dinosaurs that are in our galleries to the hidden gems like the giant squid in our basement. Now, I've got a question for you. What do blue Smarties have to do with pink flamingos? The answer is that the vibrant colours that they have are given by microorganisms. Today we are going microscopic so stay with us and um, to and send your questions through because museum researcher Anne Jungbird is going to join us today to answer those questions and my own one and talk about how microorganisms give colour to uh, things like Asmartes, flamingos, but also mountains, paddles and forests. So uh, stay with us and uh, with me, say hello to Anne. Hi Anne, how are you doing? So good to Hi. have you. Hi, it's great being here today. Brilliant. So Anne, uh, I think we need to tell our viewers what's going on with Asmartes. What do blue Asmartes have to do with microorganisms? Yeah, great question. So yeah, they are, um, well, Smarties have lots of different colors and some people might remember a while ago, the blue Smarties were taken off the market. And, and that was because the company noticed that there were some um, health effects associated with the artificial um, coloring that was used. And then they said, okay, we're gonna stop selling it and we want to use some natural coloring and natural product and then what they were able was to find was that there is um, an organism called blue green algae or cyanobacterium that makes a blue color um, a, a pigment protein system that makes this color which is blue and that's very stable and so then they turned that blue color from a microorganism into a food color that's now in all the smarties and many other food products so what we can see in the image is one of those cyanobacteria, the bacteria that produce um, that blue color, even though in the image it looks a little bit green, but the color is blue. Microorganisms, really difficult to see with the naked eye as well, but turn out they can be quite useful for us. So we're going to have a look at all the microorganisms as well that give color, not only to things that we eat, but also all the things in nature. But um, we were talking about food coloring, and there are also other things that um, researchers are, are looking into to see if we can use um, natural pigments that come from different parts of nature, uh, of, sorry, for, from microorganisms uh, to give color to, to things that we use, is that right? Yeah, so there's a really great interest and drive in finding natural colorings, like, um, yeah, colors that can be taken from the environment. And people are working on, yeah, on, on um, say, on algae, on bigger, own, like seaweeds, but they also are actually looking at bacteria. So they have found if they take bacteria, they grow them in the lab, which looks probably a bit more like just a medical experiment. They grow them, they actually turn purple, and they can use the the color and their stable um, colors that can be used and and the fashion industry is really interested in that. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to see them turning from, you know, big organisms like plants, traditional use, traditionally used for, for pigments and colors and actually looking at, at the tiny, tiny ones. Uh, because if we move to more natural settings, microorganisms, uh, algae, um, cyanobacteria, bacteria, um, and yeast, they give color to a lot of things. And that's why I was really excited to, to have you here with us, Anne, because we're going to have a look at that, at the color that we see around us and that we're not aware that actually is given uh, by these microorganisms that we can't see, but they're actually, you know, given this, us these striking colors. Uh, so we mentioned flamingos at the beginning as well, and people might be a little bit more familiar about how flamingos get those amazing colors those amazing reds and pinks from the diet. But what people might not know is that it's actually, again, microorganisms that are producing those vibrant um, colors. Can you tell us a little bit more about this, Anne? Yeah, so that's true. So um, the flamingos, when they, um, um, when they're born, they, they are actually white um, or gray and they take up um, the colors through the food. And so when they're in their natural environments, they, um, they graze these, um, these kind of mud <clears throat> plains, these shallow waters where you have a lot of biofilms growing. And these biofilms, these, the, the green, I guess, green slime is full of algae and they produce um, 
colors, pigments, and they produce like orangey, reddish pigments. And one of them is called astaxanthin, and it's very stable pigment. And so they they eat they eat the um, the biofilms, the slime, and they they break up. Um, the biofilm and use it for nutrition, but the pigments are really stable and then they go into the feathers and stay there for a certain time. That's amazing. It, and it just stays there. So it's not that they have the bacteria growing in them, is that actually the pigment uh, just has been absorbed by by the body, by the by the feathers. That's that's incredible. And one thing that I wanted to ask you actually, these microorganisms that have these pigments, those pigments, they don't use them for colours. Per se, they use them to defend themselves against, I don't know, light, for example, or for other reasons. Is that right? The the microorganisms, yeah. I mean, they produce um, colors. Um, so some of the pigments are um, like a UV screen, so like carotenoids, like the carrot. So the same color that makes the carrot orange also is produced by algae. Um, and they are UV screen. Um, I mean, some colors, um, they, yeah, some some UV screens and some of them um, might also um, protect against oxygen radicals and some are just exactly. by absorbing the light. We'll go through a bit more of that in the future with more examples because we've got more. But as, as, as I was saying before, so um, even though flamingos have the color from microorganisms, the micro microorganisms have disappeared. But if we look at all the animals, sometimes there are relationships between the microorganisms and the actual uh, animal. So, for example, corals. Corals is a, is a good example of that. Um, there is a microorganism living uh, within the coral there um, and giving them those are striking some of those are striking colors that we can see over there is that right Anne? yeah so um corals they are um animals i mean they don't look like maybe animals like an elephant or cat but they are um they are animals a simple form like a simple morphology an animal and they have tiny algae so like miniature plants growing like the well, mean algae they are microorganisms but they um have a physiology like a miniature plant growing inside them and they get up to 90 percent of their energy like their food from these algae and um and that helps them to grow and so when you have um coral bleaching coral bleaching happens when the um the coral is stressed like when there was the quite um warm weather um events in the great bear reef and then that leads to the um the coral like the animal part to release the these algae and then um without um the food, um, the the coral eventually will die, and that leads to the coral bleaching. Absolutely. So they lose those vibrant colors, as we can see in the picture here. They just got um, muted, but they basically uh, are on the brink of of dying at some point. I imagine. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so, uh, but we don't have to just look at you know, the, the waters defined microorganisms that uh, give color to different animals. And I, this is an example that I actually love. And uh, sloths actually get some of the colors from from microorganisms. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? What, what, how does this work? Yeah, so um, so the sloths, peop when people see, um, see them in documentaries or photos, they often have the fur, it's like a little bit green. And that's because they um, have algae growing in their fur. Um, and it seems that most of us have, um, lots of them have algae growing in them. And people are now studying the algae, like they find out the species and they find out how they're related to other algae. And it seems that there's some algae now um, have their preference to growing on the sloth. So it seems that they are somehow specializing to, to grow in the fur. So people don't really know why it's a really good environment, but it seems there are, yes, yeah, certain algae species really um, seem to survive well growing in the fur of the sloth. That's amazing. So they prefer to, to leave there than, than in any other place that might have, you know, for, in, our, in our minds might have looked a little bit better for them, but that's their, their habitat now. That's incredible. And um, I just wanted to mention that we've got uh, an eight-year-old uh, person watching and they are loving it. So I just want to say there's more to, to come. So stay with us because we are talking a lot about a lot of cool things that 
micro microorganisms um, keep coming. Um, and I've got loads of questions ready for you. But if any of our viewers have any questions as well, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get through as many as possible. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please consider giving a donation to the museum because it's always a great help. Um, big or small, um, it, it always helps us to continue doing all the, the work that we, we do at the museum. We'll put a link to our website on the chat, but you can also donate directly on a button that is by the chat on uh, on the YouTube. But um, And from animals, I want to move into uh, landscape because microorganisms not only give uh, colour to uh, living things but also to huge spaces like the picture that we can see here. Now I love the name of this, this is called Watermelon Snow and it's not as creepy as it might look. What is Watermelon Snow, Anne? Yeah, so I think earlier this year there was actually a lot in the media how Antarctica and some of the Alps been turning like blood red and, and it was like, yeah, all over the news. And so the color of the what's called the watermelon snow is, ma is made out of these microalgae. And so they are algae that are specialized in growing in snow. So they're like extremophiles. So they find ways to survive in the ice. And, um, and again, they are able to produce a specific color, which is this kind of red, purple, really, really intense color and they produce it in the presence of a lot of light. And that then, because they grow really well um, in summer, and I guess with increasing temperatures, um, they can just cover all, can cover huge parts of glaciers in, um, yeah, around the world. That's amazing. And I've never seen that in real life. I've seen it in pictures and it just blew my mind that, you know, snow can be red and that color can be given by actually microorganisms and also huge spaces of, of uh, huge um, areas of snow as well. Um, but and what people might be a bit more familiar with is when, you know, you're going for a walk um, on the park or around at your areas and you see a puddle and it has like kind of like a um, layer of oily iridescent color. Um, I, and I always assumed that that was, um, you know, a car had broken down or uh, oil had to spill on the pavement for whatever reason, and that had happened. I wonder if any of our viewers have seen it, so tell us in the comments if you have. But actually, sometimes it's not due to actual oil, it's due to microorganisms uh, living on, on the, those little puddles, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I and mean, again, that's really cool, like what microbes can do and how like these um, invisible organisms become, do something that is really visible and, and seen everywhere. Yeah, so this um, appearance of these kind of oily films, they are produced by bacteria that live in the soil and they're bacteria that like iron. So they use iron in a way to um, get energy and, and to grow. And they, by um, using the iron, they turn the iron, um, the oxidized iron, they turn the iron into rust. And these tiny then rust particles, they form, they form this film on these puddles. And um, you can actually check if when you see this, when you go somewhere for a walk, I mean, I've seen it all around the world. I live in London, so if you live in London, um, in Hampstead Heath, like in, um, in spring when it's particularly muddy, you can see it and you can test whether it's from the bacteria or it is unfortunately an oil spill. So if you um, see one of those puddles, take a little branch, little stick or just a bit of grass. And then if um, the film breaks up in, and in pieces, then it's by bacteria. And if it forms lines um, like having oil um, and vinegar mix, then it's unfortunately an oil spill. But if it breaks into parts, then it is produced by bacteria that are living in the soil. I will definitely be trying that out next time I see one of those. Uh, and I now I know that I've seen uh, I've seen them in the past, and I think you see them in in areas you say in the in the park, and you go, how did oil how did an oil spill got here? And actually, is is nothing like that. It's actually, you know, microorganisms growing and, and breaking down iron, which is incredible. Um, also, another thing that people might be more familiar with and had never imagined that might have been created by uh, microorganisms are uh, amazing patterns in mountains. I think we have a, a 
an, an image that I think will uh, will make people realize that they've seen this before. Now, these lines, these black lines that we see over there, it's not part of the rock, is it? Um, no, so yeah, so if you have first look, you it could be part of the geology or could be, yeah, something, I don't know, some, some soil that's stuck to it, but these are actually um, unique microbial community and they were first described um, in Germany where they're called a Tintenstriche, which is basically an incline, like somebody has spilled black ink over the mountains. And so these lines are microbial communities, like microbiomes that have algae in them, and they produce a really, really dark pigment called skytonemin, and that pigment is, if lots of that it together, it's, it's black. And so they're living there and it's probably in a region where once in a while there is a little bit of water running there because algae, they only need water and some nutrients to grow because they get the energy from the sun. And so they're there and they're surviving and because it's, um, they're very exposed to um, the sunlight, they produce these um, pigments. And so, yeah, so they are actually um, living um, ecosystems. It is amazing. Again, once again, I, I would have seen those and never imagined that it was an actual, like you said, and I love how you put it, a living ecosystem growing growing in, in the rock, in the mountain, uh, and changing the, the way that it looks. I love the name as well, and I must say the Tintin Street um, is a beautiful name as well, and really visual, like the watermelon snow one. Um, now, these, these lines of ink, uh, they can also, they not only appear in mountains, but any other rocky surfaces like monuments or statues like that, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So they can occur on mountains, but also in monuments. And they they form these, um, they're com like a mixture of different organisms. You get the algae producing a pigment like the skytonemin, but you also get other organisms living in there. So for example, there is yeast. So there is um, baking yeast that are used for baking, but there's also yeast living in the environment. And so, um, they live in the environment and they also um, can produce a production against sunlight. And so they actually produce melanin, like the melanin that we have in our skin, because even though yeast are microorganisms, they are, um, I guess, more related to to humans than to, to plants or bacteria. And so, yeah, so um, you get these um, black yeast growing in there. And so actually here, um, you then um, you get even more complex um, communities. So um, you get other organs, you get, for example, um, you get lichens in there. So lichens are a bit more microscopic and they are uh, um, like this organism actually that's what well, this lichens are um, two organisms that have to live together. So they're made out of a, an algae that can do photosynthesis and then it is made out of a fungi. And so they can also produce various um, types of pigments. And so they can be more green, they can be more orange, yellow, white or black. Mm -hmm. So all these communities of micro microorganisms and, some, uh, and even the lichens included in there mm -hmm. that are, again, changing mm -hmm. the colors of, of the rocks, the, the, um, mm -hmm. the spaces that, mm -hmm. where we live in. And we had a, a really good question from Andrew on Facebook. They were asking, don't algae mats also get fossilized? Do they get fossilized? Yeah, that's true. That's a great question. So we have algal mats that maybe grow on a rock, but algae, when they um, grow in water, they can um, um, precipitate um, carbonates, which is basically lime scale, and that forms fossils that we know from um, early Earth. So yeah, algae, like algae mats are very old. They like cyanobacteria were the first organism that produced the oxygen and they are um, we're covering all aquatic system around the world and so um, there are people studying these fossils um, to understand life on early earth. That was an amazing question and it's incredible as well that we can see fossils that tell us that algae were around for millions of years um, and that actually uh, just make me think of the uh, the biofilms that you know the tinder streak uh, for example would that 
that will take a long time to appear, I imagine as well. But things like the watermelon snow will be something that happens in a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the watermelon snow appears within weeks. It comes every every season. And these um, communities, the these Tittenstrich communities, they will grow over many, many years. And they will probably, um, so if it's very dry, they might go kind of dormant or kind of um, protect themselves by going to kind of a, um, in a dormant phase until there's more water. And they will grow over many years, yeah. That's incredible as well. So more more history there and on on our microorganisms. Uh, now, and we've been talking about landscape. We've been talking about animals um, and even artificial coloring that uh, microorganisms are, are given around the world. But I really, really want to mention uh, one of the things that really, really struck me. And I remember chatting to you about this. Um, and one color that is given by microorganisms that maybe will caught people a little bit by surprise because it's all around us, we see it every day, but we might not realize that its origin is microorganisms and that, and that is the green of plants. So can you tell us a little bit more, what, how come the green of plants has a micro, microbe um, origin? Yes, yeah, so the color of plants comes through chloroph um, chloroplast, which um, absorb um, the light, uh, the red light, and they stay so we can see the green light. But the history of the chloroplast is that it actually evolved from microorganism. So it's called now the endosymbiont um, theory, which is the scientific term, but it basically means that um, there was made, like many, like a long time ago, like on early earth there were an ancestral eukaryote like a simple cell and that would ingest uh, um, ancestral blue green algae cyanobacterium this um, photosynthetic um, bacterium and it would uh, move it inside itself but it did not eat it and it made it part of its cell and so out of that then all the um, the seaweeds and the plants and everything evolved and so the chloroplast is actually um, originally from a cyanobacterium. And we can still see it because if we um, look at the DNA of the chloroplast, it's very similar to cyanobacteria. So we can still see that the green in the plants evolved from um, the cyanobacteria. That's incredible. So, and in the picture that we've seen, we've seen a, a plant mm -hmm. cell. So that's the kind of like a squarey thing mm -hmm. that we've seen. And inside is those chloroplasts that mm -hmm. used to be ancient cyanobacteria that were mm -hmm. engulfed by a by a bigger cell. Is that right? So we can, if we're looking at, at a plant cell through a microscope, we can see those chloroplasts. Is that is that correct? Yeah, we can see them. Yeah, and we can see the individual chloroplast and. Um, yeah, if we study the features of the chloroplast, we see still find characteristics similar to the bacteria. I, that is that um, that then the, the, in the symbiotic theory, I, it always blows my mind because it just shows how you know a cell was going to eat another cell, mm -hmm. but then just realized that it was useful for them, mm -hmm. so they just kept it. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a, a another question coming from, mm -hmm. from Facebook. Hillary was asking, uh, they were saying, I have a decorative marble water dish in my garden, so I suppose a, a, a structure with water uh, that collects rainwater, um, and it turns bright red not green, not any other color. Could the red be from an algae for, as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, it could, depends. It, yeah, so it could be from a red, like a, a small algae that produces a red pigment, or it could be from um, bacteria that um, create um, rust. Oh, so it could be different things. It could it could be, be the, or maybe it was more, yeah, if it forms more like a slimy biofilm, then it's maybe more an algae. But if it's more like a like kind of a flocculent kind of red, then it's maybe more bacterial. I think from now on, after people watching yeah. this this uh, this show and are going to start paying attention every time this is something growing, they'll be like, "Whoa, is it is it from the thing itself, or is it something growing in it?" And I um, think that is really cool. Yeah, I mean, it might be so, I mean, microbes are amazing. So they grow, so once they have very good condition, 
microorganisms, they will grow really, really fast. And then when they say, if you have somewhere rainwater in a bowl, then um, they will grow. But if it dries up, they will go maybe dormant and then maybe only very few survive. And they just stay there and they just survive and wait until the conditions get better and then they grow again. Mm -hmm. But that's absolutely fine, isn't it? It's just yeah. uh, nature, the right conditions yeah. for something to grow and, and they'll grow over there. That's brilliant. Uh, now, Anne, what I really, really hope is, is that from now on, when people go around and have a look around them and see the colours, actually wonder where they were coming from. If it's, uh, you know, just the colour that um, an organism is producing or is it something that is being produced by something that we can see with our naked eye and maybe we'll look a little bit closer. Definitely, I'm going to um, prick any any puddle that I see with that oily bit. Um, but and we've uh, reached the end of the show. It was fantastic to have you here. Uh, and I hope that our viewers have enjoyed it as much as we can. I think we've got much more to talk about, though. So you will have to come back in the future and tell us more about the microorganisms that are around us. So, yeah, and thank you so much. See you in the future. I'm going to say goodbye to you from now. Bye, Anne. Thank you very much. And thank you as well, everyone from uh, from home uh, for, for watching us and being there and sending your excellent questions. I really hope that you enjoy the show as much as I can. And I said before, if you see one of those oily puddles, just pick up it. Pay attention to your surroundings and, and have a look at the nature around you. Now, that was all from uh, us today. But remember, the Nature Light happens every Tuesday at 1 p.m. And next week, we'll be actually having a dive into uh, a pond and we'll be having a look at the organisms, the living organisms that live in ponds around us. So don't miss that. Uh, as, as I said before, 1 p.m. next Tuesday. If you want to know more, check our website. And uh, once again, if you've enjoyed the show, if you've been enjoying Nature Live Online, uh, why not making a donation? It's always really appreciated and a huge help. You can click on the button uh, on the chat, on the YouTube chat, or you can go directly to our website and we'll put a link on the chat. But that's all from me today. Hopefully, see you next time. Bye.